Hello, vinyl community. So, uh, I've noticed lately that uh, ranking videos are coming back. Um, and uh, I've seen some of them in the last weeks. Um, I basically blame Shannon for that and uh, Bobby, aka Liner Notes. Don't you know that serious music collectors don't do ranking? But thankfully, I'm rather infantile and a bit of a geek. So um, I thought I will contribute my uh, next uh, ranking video. I've done one uh, in March, maybe, or May. Uh, this was my Yes Studio Albums ranking. And um, it was complete mayhem. Um, I tend to do those things a little too analytic. So I thought this time this should be an, another lesson for me in uh, being brief, being intuitive. Don't make science out of it, so here we go. Here is my ranking of uh, the Emerson, Lake and Palmer catalog. But, little caveat, I thought I can uh, spice it up a little bit. By the way, there is not a single cloud on the sky right here. It's so hot. It, this will be... I mean, the day has just started, but I can already tell you that this is going to be a really hot day, so... The best circumstances to make videos. <laughs> Let's sweat on camera. Life. Um, so, um, what was I saying? Um, yeah, ELP didn't make that many um, studio albums, so I thought I would kind of uh, enhance the field by adding one or two rules. Um, so the three rules of this ranking is, first, uh, no compilations. That's usually a given. Second, live albums count as long as they were produced in the 70s because then later after that all this quagmire of live albums uh, started to appear and I don't know much about those. And um, most important, um, if uh, there is a album where two-thirds of EL or P are present, then it still counts. <clears throat> but this concerns only two records. But that's the whole story, and uh, now uh, let's get on with it. So uh, we're talking about 14 records here, 14 albums, and uh, my least favorite in this department is this one, To the Power of Three by the band Three. So um, this was a effort from 1988, um, a time when uh, the music scene was widely controlled by bands like the Pet Shop Boys, so uh, you can kind of imagine that this was a bit of a tough time for someone like Emerson <laughs> to <laughs> make his mark uh, in this kind of a musical environment, um, and here he certainly tried, but um, yeah, it's a corny pop album. Um, Emerson cer certainly infuses some uh, good uh, keyboard sounds into the whole mix, and uh, um, yeah, and the new guy, uh, Robert Barry on bass, uh, is certainly a good bass player, but uh, I think the compositions just don't hold much water. There is a track, though, called Desde la Vida. I kind of wish they would have uh, used this track as a kind of a template for the entire album, then it would have probably been a rather decent record. Now, if I look this one up on YouTube, um, I find still a lot of people commenting under the song saying that this is one of their favorite albums, so what do I know? It's great that an album like that can find its audience, it's just not my cup of coffee. Number 13, um, the 1994's album In the Hot Seat, basically the last studio album Emerson, Lake and Palmer ever recorded, their second effort in the 90s. This was produced by Keith Olsen, who was extremely unhappy with this project and uh, later he said that this was like one of his biggest mistakes and that the band appeared rather orientationless and um, mostly in a foul mood. There are one or two tracks that I kind of like. Um, certainly the last one, Street War, is a decent song. There's a track called Man in the Long Coat. I can live with it. The first one, The Opener Hand of Truth, is not particularly bad. Um, but overall, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a middle-of-the-road effort um, and uh, certainly uh, not an album I would crave a lot. Yeah, um, let's stay in the same decade. 
number 12 is the 1992's Black Moon. Now this is not a bad sounding album at all. It was by, by the way produced by Mark Mancina who later became a big composer in Hollywood. Um, yeah, I mean, if I if I would if I wanted to overly criticize this record, I would say that this is a kind of an Asia type of shit with a lot of boring power ballads. But um, looking closer, there is certainly interesting material there. I prefer the opening track, Black Moon. Certainly, there's a good song called Changing States. Has a brilliant vibe. Uh, Close to Home is a good song. Better Days, and even this. Ballad at the end, Footprints in the Snow. Um, it's lovely to listen to it, but it's always lovely to uh, listen to Greg Lake's wonderful voice. So, um, this album is not a disaster, but on the other hand, um, I kind of remember when the rumor started that there will be, after so many years, another studio album by Emerson Slake and Palmer. Uh, that's something that gets you excited and you hold your breath, and well, then you get this. And um, it's an okay rock album, but uh, the point is, um, this has happened too many times and I, I'm just not holding my breath anymore. That's kind of the point. So, um, number 11 is uh, the 1977's live album In Concert. Now, this is a solid, uh, good sounding live album, but uh, also I find it a bit problematic in parts. Um, I guess my my favorite aspect of this album is uh, the the enemy god dances with the black spirit this Prokofiev uh, adaptation uh, which is more like a showpiece for Karl Palmer this sounds pretty brilliant it's like a it's like a rock stone rock avalanche or something it's really heavy there's a good version of knife edge here um, but there are certainly some things that um, do not make me that much happy. One of them is uh, Greg Lake's bass sound. I mean, he started to use some kind of uh, custom-made bass guitar in this period of time and uh, it's kind of an eight string bass where every string is basically doubled by a thinner string that uh, resonates like one octave higher um, which sounds like a good idea and uh, it's kind of cool at the beginning. Um, I mean it, it has almost this kind of a cembalo type of vibe if this makes any sense but honestly one album later it just kind of feels a little obnoxious the other problem let's put it that way this record here is important because it kind of captures a certain chapter in this band's history um, and uh, that in itself is certainly interesting this is the time when they've been touring with this giant orchestra and basically ruining themselves um, Something that I guess uh, Carl Palmer and Greg Lake never forgave Keith Emerson, who led the charge on this project. The point is, I always felt that uh, the one aspect of Emerson, Lake and Palmer, the one magical part about this band lies in the fact that they can take something that probably was once orchestral and they can turn it into fascinating music played by three people. So uh, kind of closing the circle by starting to play with a giant orchestra kind of defies the purpose and honestly it doesn't sound that good. This is a great orchestra, great conductor, everything is all right with it, but uh, or orchestras just don't sound very well in a stadium rock setting and this is a band playing giant stadiums at this point and uh, this is just not the musical environment for an orchestra. So I don't think that the orchestra can shine in a recording like that and Honestly, um, it's uh, something that um, the music suffers from. However, I didn't want to speak that long about this one record. And let's go to the number 10, which is uh, the Works Volume 2. Here in my Mexican edition, where even the Works is translated into Spanish. Obras. Um, yeah, this came out the same year, like the live album. Um, I don't know exactly why this album came out. This is a good question. I guess the band was so entangled with this whole giant orchestra project that they just wanted to find a way to throw out a studio album. I also believe that at this point they were trying to speed things up to fulfill their contract with Atlantic and with uh, Ahmed Ertegun and uh, they kind of tried to 
uh, probably get out of this contract so they couldn't uh, throw out uh, studio albums fast enough. So what they did is taking a lot of leftovers from uh, the previous two years and uh, put them together as an album. That doesn't mean that everything is kind of wrong or bad with this record. Actually, there are some really uh, nice songs on it, particularly a track called Bullfrog, which kind of sounds like King Crimson. Um, there is a track called Brain Salad Surgery, which obviously is a leftover from the Brain Salad Surgery sessions. That track is good enough. I, th I always felt they should have left it on the Brain Salad Surgery album. Um, certainly, maybe as a replacement for Benny the Bouncer that you can't get rid of quick enough. There is a track called, and I have to look it up because it's far too long as a title, Quando el manzano de fruto en tu mente sere tu novio. Oh, that's a Spanish translation. Yeah, the English title is When the apple blossoms bloom in the windmills of your mind, I'll be your valentine. Now this is an insane title, but the song behind it is quite charming and I really like it. But the for me, the gem on this album and the rather overlooked track on this album is called Close But Not Touching and is a Carl Palmer production. And uh, honestly, that's the best song on the album, I think. So um, it's not all bad with this record, uh, but uh, it's a bit of a weird one. Now let's get to number nine. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends, ladies and gentlemen, Emerson, Lake and Palmer. It's a famous, infamous uh, live album. Now, good stuff, bad stuff. The good stuff about this album is it's huge, it's three discs long, it's a triple album. Um, I think when it came out, it was a rather uh, generous move uh, by Emerson, Lake and Palmer because uh, it wasn't very expensive, it kind of cost like normal record um, and you got a lot of music and I think this album perfectly captures this band at their peak touring their best material and uh, the choice of the tracks is quite good and yeah, this is a wonderful snapshot of this era and probably the closest you will ever get to experience how it was when uh, this band was touring in their prime. But there is also the negative stuff and that's in this case it really doesn't sound that good. It's not a particularly good recording. Actually many people before me have uh, noted that it kind of sounds like a bootleg and um, it should be mentioned that this is a production that was not engineered by Eddie Offord and probably that's the reason. Um, number eight is Works Volume 1, again um, in a Mexican edition. Uh, and um, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's an odd one and uh, it certainly documents a band that is systematically falling apart and where all three members kind of don't really like to work with each other, so uh, they came up with this idea to make basically three solo albums and couple them together as a double album with a fourth side where everybody plays together. Uh, so you have you get only two tracks on this record that are kind of genuine Emerson, Lake and Palma tracks and the rest is just solo material. Well, it has been done before, remember, with, uh, with Uma Guma by Pink Floyd. Um, I mean, I find a lot of interesting songs here. I really don't hate this album. So yeah, okay, there is the Piano Concerto Numero Uno by Kate Emerson. It's it's a great piece of orchestra music. It's lovely to listen. It's not that long. It's it's one side of a record. It's survivable. It's quite uh, refreshing and um, rather nice to listen. But at the same time, uh, it kind of it's it's it suffers probably a little bit. It depends how you look at it. If you look at it from a perspective of someone who never dealt with classical music before, then um, it's something to be excited about because it's. Uh, quite adventurous as an orchestral piece. If you put it inside the large ocean of orchestral uh, w body of work, then it certainly doesn't shine that much, particularly because it feels very derivative. I mean, there's a lot of influences you can hear by 
Aaron Copeland and Debussy and Ravel and uh, a bit of Tchaikovsky. So um, it's fine music, but uh, but as an orchestral piece, it's slightly old-fashioned. Um, of course, Greg Lake never got tired to tell this one story about how they recorded it in Paris uh, in the Pate Studios, and uh, they kind of managed to drag uh, Leonard Bernstein into the studio, so he gave it a listen. And Bernstein was slightly bored by it, and in the end he mm. remarked that it makes him think of Grandma Moses, no, Greg Lake, who had a lot of beef with Emerson in the following 30 years, uh, never got tired to tell this story and was always chuckling. Uh, but I kind of get it. I, I know exactly what he meant. Still, um, the B-side, all Greg Lake songs, is this uh, orgy of love songs that suddenly keep kind of pouring out of him, probably because he wasn't allowed to make them the three years or four years prior to that. And um, good songs. Um, I certainly, my favorite song from the Greg Lake side is certainly uh, Hello Be Thy Name. This is an excellent production. I love C'est La Vie. It's a corny song, but um, overall a good track. Um, when I was younger, I, I, I tend to completely dismiss the Carl Palmer side. That's a bit of a mistake, because now I gave it a listen and realized, yeah, the Palmer side is pretty exciting, actually. There is a track called uh, L.A. Nights, which is very great. There is a two-part invention in D minor, which is based on something by Johann Sebastian Bach, and it's mostly played on xylophones and vibraphones, and it's quite wonderful. And there's a track called Food for Your Soul, which is great as well. So actually, uh, kind of, in hindsight, I've become a bit of a fan of the Carl Palmer side on this record. Yeah, and then you have uh, Fun Fairs for the Common Man by... Um, Aaron Copland and uh, the infamous pirate song. Yeah, the pirate song is a bit of a infantile production, honestly, but uh, but it's well, it's well, it's well done. It sounds good. Uh, it's not something I kind of return back to a lot, but um, I've already talked too much about this album. Let's get to number seven. Number seven is the 1986 album Emerson, Lake and Powell. Now Cosi Powell as a replacement for, for Carl Palmer, not such a bad idea actually. Um, what a lucky break that he has the same initials, but putting that aside, um, I always liked this record. When I bought it, I didn't expect too much of it, I was really suspicious, um, but uh, even back in the day, in the 80s, when I listened to it, I thought this is not bad. I mean, there is something about it that is pretty charming. Uh, I like it much better than the Power of the Three album. And um, yeah, I mean, you have a you have a track like uh, Touch and Go, which is quite great. The Miracle is probably my favorite on this album. Wonderful, wonderful song. Um, the opener, the score, is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I mean, it has a very coherent handwriting, that's what I like about it. This is a kind of a well-thought effort and uh, what came out is a good album. Um, they even have not given up on the adaptations of classical materials, so in the end you get Mars the Bringer of War, obviously by The Planets by Gustav Holst, which uh, works very well um, transformed into this kind of a Emersonian universe. So, uh, it's actually a good album. I like it. Number six. Number six is 1978's Love Beach. Oh yes, we have reached the most controversial point of this video. Yes, I get it. This is uh, one of those very much hated one. I mean, there are YouTubers that have dedicated so much of their personal life's time just to slug this album off and take it apart and express all their disgust and hate over it. Oh man, now first of all everybody is, gets always upset about the cover saying that the band looks like the Bee Gees here. Like it's a bad thing, come on! I like the cover. I always wanted to make a giant poster of this cover and just put it over my bed just to piss people off. It's something in me that feels the need to provoke people with Love Beach. I really like Love Beach. This is a cute album. First of all, 
If you have a band that is trying to get out of a contract with Ahmed Ertegen and uh, goes to Nassau to record it, I mean, this is what you get. I mean, there's really nothing wrong <laughs> with it. So, um, I'm not saying that this is a masterpiece. I'm not saying we should build shrines around it. But uh, it can't hurt to give it a chance. But also I'm always a bit fascinated by um, albums that regardless of their intrinsic quality are perfect documentation or perfect snapshot of a band at a certain point in time. And this album does this quite greatly. And um, honestly I, kind of, I really like the songs on this album. I like Love Beach, the title track. I certainly like Taste of My Love, which is probably one of my favorite ELP songs. So, um, what can I say? For You is an incredible song. Now you have the B-side, which is uh, basically this giant um, memoirs of an officer and a gentleman uh, thing. Um, yeah, I mean, there's something weird and corny about it, but at the same time it has a lot of amazing melodies. So, uh, overall... I think this is a great summer album and uh, I don't expect anybody to crawl in dust because of it, but um, from time to time it would deserve a little more appreciation, a little more love. So this brings us to the number five and that's the 1971's Pictures at an Exhibition, um, a live album that certainly sounds much better than Welcome Back My Friends. And uh, maybe the reason is because the live recording was engineered by Eddie Offord. And uh, I think Eddie Offord uh, is uh, certainly to some extent an integral part of uh, this band's qualities. Yeah, um, Mussorgsky's uh, Pictures and Exhibition is a piano piece. People think often that uh, the original material is an orchestral piece that was kind of adapted into this band performance, but it's not entirely true. And actually it makes Mussorgsky even more appear like a true genius, because if you imagine all these rather noisy parts, this is supposed to be all played on a piano. Yes, the orchestral version of Pictures at an Exhibition is probably more famous than the original by Mussorgsky, who composed this kind of in the late 80s of the 19th century. But the orchestration was, I think, done by Maurice Ravel in the 10s or 20s. Um, but uh, obviously um, was more appealing to a broader audience back in the day. So it's actually people people rather know the, the orchestrated version, which uh, Mussorgsky had nothing to do with. But uh, I'm already on a tangent. Yeah, this is uh, this is one of those albums that uh, are really tempting to be listened from beginning to the end. Uh, it's not a song-oriented album. It's more like these moods and themes that are mor morphing into each other. Um, there is one uh, little gem in the middle of it, which is a, co a song called The Sage by Greg Lake, which you can only find on this live record here. The wonderful, mysterious folk song. I really like it. Um, yeah, so I love the Greg Lake's bass sound here on this record. I mean, he sounds his bass sounds really wonderful here. By the way, the, the concert took place in the Newcastle City Hall on March 26, 1971, which means when this was played live, I was exactly six days old. So let's get to number four, and this is uh, the debut album Emerson, Lake and Palmer from 1970. This is a debut album, so um, having a debut album like that, not a bad thing. This is already with Eddie Offord um, engineering it, so um, you can hear it and it's a good thing. And um, you have some of these wonderful Emerson, Lake and Palmer songs here that became stuff of legends. I mean, the entire A-side, basically, the Barbarian, Take a Pebble, Knife Edge. When I was a kid, I was really proud of Knife Edge because it's based on um, a orchestral composition of a countryman of mine, Leo Janáček and his Sinfonietta. Um, so, uh, which is something when you are growing up as a kid in in, in the Czech Republic, or back in the day it was Czechoslovakia. This was something you probably knew from your music lessons or music class at school. Um, 
Yeah, uh, certainly one of my favorites on this album is Tank, a rather a Carl Palmer oriented effort. Uh, actually, if you listen to Tank, wow, I mean, thinking that this is 1970, this sounded, sounded really original and very much pushing the envelope. Uh, yeah, certainly a great album. Yeah, and the band that hardly ever smiled, but uh, that's a different story. So, only three albums left, and I guess everybody who knows at least a little about Emerson, Lake and Palmer knows exactly what these three albums are. And the only magical question is, in which order will they appear now? Will it be the obvious order or not? We will see. So, uh, number three is, uh, for me, the 1973's Brain Salad Surgery. The one album that usually everybody puts at one. Now, we are in the finale of the whole video, so there is not that much disrespect here towards the album. Obviously, it's a great album. Carnival 9 is just a giant musical experience, and uh, I have nothing bad to say about it. Let's be real here. Still You Turn Me On is a wonderful ballad, so this uh, album has a lot to offer. Most certainly, most certainly, it is the best cover design Emerson, Lake and Palmer ever had. Uh, regarding the fact that they were such a huge and such an important band, I always felt that a lot of their record covers were just below par, but not in this case. Uh, this obviously was a cover of historic proportions designed by the Swiss artist Hans Rudi Giger. And uh, yeah, a brilliant album, what can I say? But uh, the reason why it's on third place here and not on first is that I always felt that it doesn't sound that great. I never really, really liked the sound that much. It's not a bad sounding album at all. You can just listen to it and probably most people will not have any issue with it. But for me, ah, I have, I have three versions of this album. I have this here. I have this one here, and I have a CD, and none of them is really 100% satisfying as far as sound goes. I can't explain to you why. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to mention that this was the first album they decided to do without Eddie Offord. We kind of, Greg Lake completely took over the production. Um, yeah, I mean, I know, I kind of know what they were after because the previous album has been uh, such a bombastic uh, production that it was almost impossible to be replicated on stage and they thought let's create a studio album that from a technical point of view can be very precisely replicated on tour. And um, yeah, so um, obviously I like this album, it has a lot to offer, but um, um, it doesn't 100% cut with me. Now, uh, number two is the 1971's Tarkus. Tarkus is uh, obviously a legendary album, a wonderful A-side, a lot of brilliant stuff. Um, I like Bitches Crystal a lot, I like Time in a Space, and I certainly love the sound of this record. This is a wonderful Eddie Offord engineering job and a great joy to listen to it. The cover, never was that much of a fan of it, but uh, after 30-40 years you kind of started to get used to it. And uh, that's all I can say about it. So, number one, 1972's Trilogy. Um, for me the best sounding Emerson, Lake and Palmer album. I, uh, again, like Eddie Offord's work here, I really like uh, the, the choice of synth sounds and uh, I kind of understand that it created a problem for the band to bring this kind of music on stage, on tour, but um, it's a lovely record, wonderful sound, very enigmatic, uh, very progressive in parts, very fascinating and uh, very atmospheric. Um, yeah, um, probably not their best cover, it's a Hypnosis uh, cover job. Actually the backside is quite lovely, this kind of a dawn uh, mood. Um, yeah, um, there's a lovely ballad called uh, From the Beginning, which has probably my favorite Keith Emerson solo on it. Isn't it amazing? I mean, it's a kind of a little, little musing at the end of the song. And obviously they kind of tried to recreate the magic of Lucky Man, which was all very coincidental and uh, not 
particularly planned out and here they kind of artificially tried to catch the same lightning in the bottle but um, I just love the sound of this keyboard solo it's so moody and so kind of strangely detached um, wonderful I mean the b-side is really hilarious uh, I'm not a big fan of the sheriff uh, I'm not a such a big fan of hoedown even though this was kind of a concert opener for years um, but uh, honestly really honestly no my I mean, I was a I was a EOP fan since I was a kid, like fourteen years old or something. And uh, um, but in hindsight, I think the one big problem I have with the band in general is that they kind of failed to create a perfect album. For me, there is just not a single EOP album where I could not pick something and say, yeah. It's, it's unfortunate that this is there. So in a way that yes managed to create Close to the Edge and Pink Floyd managed to create Dark Side of the Moon and um, Genesis managed to create Foxtrot. I always thought that ELP never managed to create such an album. They created a lot of great music but um, even on the best of their records there is always some element of it, some component or some track where you just kind of look a little puzzled and just wonder what the hell were they thinking. But uh, that being said, this was uh, my um, ELP um, ranking and um, I hope I managed this time to be a little bit faster and not, not be rambling that much. But uh, it's the best I could do. See you next time. Goodbye.